Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, YouTube stream number three. So I'm pleased to uh, host the session again today. So I'm Pierre, Tech Leader in Trend Micro Europe. Um, and today we will speak about uh, DDI um, uh, best practice configuration and log review. And so for that, uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dimitri, one of my European colleagues. So let me switch, invite Dimitri. Hey, Dimitri. Hey, Pierre. How's it going? Good morning. How Good are you? Morning. <laughs> yeah. So, Dimitri, what, what's your role in Trend Micro? Um, I'm solution architect in uh, Trend Micro Europe, um, working with um, um, sales support organization to um, support uh, network defense products. But I'm also covering um, uh, smart factory security solutions, uh, telecom sector, and so on. Okay, good. So, and today, what we will talk about? Uh, today, we'll talk um, about um, bridge detection systems, why they're important, and we'll talk about Deep Discovery Inspector. So that's um, one of the products um, in the Deep Discovery portfolio. Okay, good. So I think we can uh, switch back to some of your content right now? Yes, please. Okay, so let's go. Good, good. You can you can start. So you have prepared some content for us. So yeah, so I have a con um, I have uh, some slides. Uh, we'll use them. I think it's uh, it's good to have a good mix between the slides, and I will also use the live system deep discovery, and we'll talk uh, about um, the uh, need of bridge detection system. Why we need this? Uh, because we already have a lot of security controls in our network. Uh, on our systems, um, then we will see from security analyst point of view, um, how do you work with this data? Uh, what value does it bring to you, uh, to the organization to um, uh, in general, but specifically for SOC uh, analyst. And um, then we'll also talk about um, tips and tricks about how to fine tune the discovery inspector in this case. Uh, mm to make it a little bit uh, more efficient, um, um, maybe less false positive, less noise, and uh, more valuable data actionable data for security analysts. Right. Right. So, and maybe we can mention that um, for any viewer uh, after this uh, session, you will be able to download the slide and uh, feel free also to shot any question in the, in the chat today, and we'll try to answer live uh, to your question, please. Yes, you can absolutely. you can start, Dimitri. All right. So, um, the bridge detection system. Um, why we need bridge detection system, right? We already have so many security controls, um, starting with the perimeter, the firewalls, intrusion prevention system, and the proxies, and the gateway machines, and so on. And we also have some controls. Uh, on the systems, on endpoints, uh, anti-malware, uh, we have um, uh, security controls on service and so on. But then uh, we always uh, need to ask ourselves a question, um, what if we get a breach? Um, can we detect the breach? Uh, how can we detect the breach? And what can we do with the data uh, that we get from the uh, detection layer beyond the protective? controls. And that's what exactly Deep Discovery Inspector is for. So if you're one of the um, customers of us, uh, uh, thank you for being a customer. And hopefully this uh, stream will help you to use the device better if you are not customer yet. So uh, maybe you'll get this inspired and at least consider the bridge detection system for your operations. Now, Deep Discovery Inspector specifically, um, I always call it a hybrid advanced threat detection mechanism. Why is it hybrid? <clears throat> because we are covering a network and um, let's say system and server uh, level threats in one machine. So on one side, it's a network device. So you connect it to a network uh, switch, uh, maybe network tab. On the other side, uh, it will be able not only inspect the network layer, but also extract files from the network stream and analyze from the application point of view if there are any exploits, maybe there are um, 
uh, techniques um, in these malicious files that are used on a system level and so on. So we cover both network and a system in one device. <clears throat> and because of the nature of the detection engines, they are not only pattern based. So we're trying to push the limits and we try to use advanced techniques to detect um, threats. Uh, so it's also good against all the target attacks uh, where um, the adversaries, they use, um, of course, advanced techniques. So we try to detect that. Uh, also, they use, um, you know, um, unique payloads, unique malware, unknown malware that we also can detect with the different techniques. I'll talk about it later. And of course, hacking tools and so on. So device is uh, port agnostic, so you can detect uh, different threats through uh, ports going, you know, out of normal. So, for example, if it's HTTP running on a um, uh, port uh, which belongs to other service, uh, like 21 or something else, then we already can detect it, but we still see it's HTTP traffic, right? So we are not bound to port numbers protocol specifications. And talking about protocols, we can uh, detect threats in more than 100 protocols. And it's not only IDS style where we uh, apply the signature and say, okay, in this protocol, when we can detect the pattern of the bad uh, traffic like exploit, but we can also extract files from the network streams. And that's from 100 plus protocols. That's where the uh, strength of the uh, technology lies. Uh, so I will cover it later, but uh, specifically in the lateral movement phase of the attack, that becomes very critical. And then, of course, the ultimate detection mechanism um, beyond um, the patterns, the signatures, and even now we talk about machine learning um, and um, you know heuristics and so on. I still believe that sandbox is the ultimate detection mechanism. And in the DBS current specter, you have ability to put custom sandbox, right? Custom meaning that you can uh, basically take the uh, OS image that you use on the endpoints or servers and particularly um, put it into the sandbox environment as an image and let captured uh, samples, files, payloads be detonated safely in this environment. It will replicate your environment as close as possible making sure that if adversary will fingerprint your environment and will try to recognize whether it's sandbox or not, um, in the generic sandbox, it will be easy to detect and they will just evade detection. But in a custom sandbox, it will be extremely complex and difficult for adversary to detect this is sandbox or is it a real machine. And we can also provide the cloud generic sandbox for, for people who, who want to use that as well. All right. Um, and appliance, of course, can be hardware or software. Let me talk quickly about the stages of the attack. Um, so when we talk about advanced attacks, it's not you know just shooting exploits towards um, uh, your public available services. It's not only um, infecting you with um, malware and worm and you know hope that it will spread somehow like uncontrolled wildfire. Target attacks are usually very controlled and they uh, are targeting people as in the name. So instead of going after the vulnerable IT systems, they go after the people. So there are stages which we've seen repeating themselves through different attacks and that's why the system works. So usually in the first stage, it's intelligence gathering. Um, besides of the technical you know, reconnaissance, uh, they will go and they will um, research people in organizations. So target organization who I'm going to attack, is it HR, is it IT? Um, maybe it's executive directly. Then after the research, maybe on social media, um, you know, whatever context they can build personally, professionally about you, they will attack you. So that will be point of entry. And the second, um, maybe I can do it like this. The second um, phase on the point of entry, it will be either email or drive by download where they will get very small footprint, some download or payload on your system, right? Then from that moment on, they will need to have visibility. So they will start uh, calling back home, command control communication will take place. So imagine that uh, they need to have this a line of communication with the infected system because that's the only way how they can control the situation. And through this line of communication, they will 
most probably the first point of entry is not the final destination. So through this line of communication, command control, they will do the lateral movement and uh, data discovery, um, hoping to find something interesting, right? Something which they can steal. Maybe it's customer data, maybe uh, uh, personal information, maybe um, um, some information about products, or supply chain information, whatever they can, you know, uh, use to their benefits. And the last phase is data exfiltration. So the data will be taken out, uh, whether directly from the final system or maybe pivoting back through the first point of entry. So that's how it looks like in the target attacks. And, and, and Dimitri, so what's, <clears throat> what's the relation with this stage of targeted attack and with DDI product? Well, how does it, how do we link it together? Yeah, it's a very good question, Pierre. Um, so Deep Discovery Inspector um, is able to recognize actually all six stages of this attack types. And um, it will attribute different detections. Imagine then when the attacker is working, there will be multiple detections, right? And you will have like a, a dump of different uh, signals from the system. So Deep Discovery Inspector is able to recognize um, these attacks and it will attribute each uh, detection to specific attack. So because of this, you'll be able to see basically a chain of events. Uh, you'll be able to understand at what stage of the attack the attacker is. Uh, and if it was already complete, so data exfiltration happened, you can trace it back to see how it happened, what kind of exposure you're now having because you can analyze the data which was leaked. And you can also uh, close the a security gap that you had that attackers used to get in as well. All right. Yeah. Um, sure. Okay. Let me kill the <laughs> rings. So as I mentioned, uh, Deep Discovery is a network device. So because of this, it's quite easy to um, start using it. Um, very low entry barrier, I would say. Um, you don't need to install anything on your uh, systems. You don't need to install anything on your servers. Um, you don't need to change your network architecture. It's very easy. So you can either use uh, uh, span ports on your switches or maybe network tabs that you already have and start monitoring. Um, what's important, what I want to stress is the positioning of the device. So here you see on the screen, um, traditional, I would say more or less uh, normal uh, network architecture of the enterprise where you have um, 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 a perimeter, so firewall and uh, DMZ. Um, you have then end users connected uh, and you have also data center somewhere, right? So usually what happens is that when a user goes out, it goes through the perimeter. Maybe it goes to, um, let's say, to proxy, and then from proxy goes to, to the internet. Um, so this communication takes place, and through this communication, you can get actually infected because the point of entry may take place through email, right? So the attacker may craft email, uh, which has uh, maybe attachment uh, with a malicious active code. Maybe it has. Uh, uh, some URLs. So the email will be coming uh, basically um, from the attacker. Um, I can just remove that. From the attacker to your mail server and from your mail server to uh, user PC. And um, if we have monitoring of this um, entry point, we'll be able to see already um, on the DDI that this point of entry took place, right? So we copy the traffic into DDI and we start analyzing the data. So we'll talk about it later, but uh, there will be a thorough investigation and inspection of the payload. Now, um, so the point of entry took place and then user um, got infected. What happens next? User will call back um, to command control center. Again, traversing the inspection point. So DDI will be able to grab the data and 
see that uh, um, activity as well. And uh, through this control command control communication, the um, uh, attacker will ask the payloads maybe to do lateral movement, to do a further propagation. So what can happen is that, for example, the malicious payload can be placed on a file server. And from that file server, it can infect some other users or maybe servers. Um, so again, if we have right position in the network and we can inspect those lines, we can also see lateral movement and uh, data and discovery um, stage. And of course, after some time when the data is found, maybe it will be exfiltrated. So it goes back to the proxy from this guy and from the proxy to the attacker. So data exfiltration phase. And again, we'll be able to see it with DDI. As you can see, very easy. Uh, with the right positioning, you can see not only north-south traffic uh, through this traffic, so the red lines right here, uh, you will have right here, you will have um, inspection of point of entry, command control, and data exfiltration. And then also east-west with the right positioning, you will get lateral movement detection data as a discovery. Again, over 100 plus protocols. So it will give you visibility, not only in common protocols at the perimeter, HTTP, DNS, uh, FTP, SMTP, and so on, but will also give you more visibility on other protocols used inside of the network, all right? Thank you, Dimitri. So we had a question in the meantime. Uh, can you sure. go back to the first slide, please? Uh, to the first slide. To this one? Yeah, uh, to yeah the, just before, to yeah. So um, we had a question regarding uh, custom sandboxing and uh, let's say default image sandboxing. And I, I, I will I will answer to this one because it's more about, uh, let's say, product management, I say. So why we offer only custom sandboxing on-premise, um, whereas some other vendors provide also default uh, image. So we, we have took the decision to, to, to do this because to force our customer to do custom sandbox. Because then we know that we believe that, let's say, the majority of people will go with the default image. And so because we see huge benefits and typically we see this in country. So for example, uh, if you have targeted attack against German uh, government, uh, German entities, German companies, uh, one of the, I mean, very easy way to detect that uh, you are targeting a right German audience is to check the keyboard, the language of the system, whatever. So if we provide generic default English image, uh, it's pretty easy to bypass. So it's really, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, it, we assume this 10, that's it. Uh, we know that uh, for you, uh, it's a, sig a significant effort to maintain the custom sandbox, uh, but there is um, defense uh, security, I mean, posture uh, defense um, uh, reason there. Uh, if really you want to get rid of custom sandbox, you can go with a cloud generated sandbox and there everything is, all the sandbox part is um, handled by Trend Micro directly. Uh, of course it's cloud-based, but anyway, everything is secure. The connection is uh, encrypted, authenticated. It goes to only to European data center and uh, there is a short-term retention uh, of uh, the submitted file and um, everything is under ISO, whatever. So you can take this option if really wants to, you you want to go to uh, you don't want to manage the sandbox. So um, hope you agree with that, Dimitri. Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And also, you will see on my next slide actually the uh, rich set of detection engine that we use. So basically, if you go with a generic sandbox, um, serious attackers will be able to evade it very very easily. And that will be kind of opportunistic um, detection for us, but we, we can compensate for, uh, for that with a much less computationally expensive uh, techniques like machine learning, for example. Because if you will recompile the same uh, malware trying to evade patterns, machine le learning will pick it up anyways. So I, I believe that Sandbox is really for detection of advanced uh, stuff. And uh, for advanced attackers, they will just evade your generic sandbox easily, easily. Okay, right. so we can uh, yeah, we can switch. Let's back move to... on. Um, so I've been through these slides. Right. Let's talk about 
how DDI detects um, threats, okay? Um, so I put some high level architecture here for you and hopefully you will bear with me. So um, in case I'm going too fast, uh, maybe I'll type it and let Pierre to, to stop me. Um, but um, yeah, that's how it looks like. If you imagine uh, this is the, the discovery box and on top you have network uh, interface card, which will capture the uh, mirror uh, of the traffic that we monitor. So um, in this case, the data will be propagating from the, uh, maybe different color, just a sec. Let's say kilo, yeah. So the, da the data is coming through network card and the first word it will hit is network content inspection engine. So network content inspection engine will analyze the network flow. It will um, uh, look simply for uh, presence of uh, uh, network viruses. It will look for match to, you can call it IDS signatures, right? Um, it will see some anomaly maybe, like I mentioned, maybe HTTP using wrong protocol or wrong port number, like not 80, not 443 HTTPS, but something else. Uh, so this kind of detections. And um, in case it detected something already, um, it will send data to network content correlation engine, which will correlate different detections um, to yield one uh, big incident, right? So, um, I will uh, actually network content inspection engine. Uh, if you're already a customer of the discovery inspector, let me switch quickly to the interface. If you go to monitoring and scanning, um, you have uh, detection rules. So these detection rules, these are actually the rules used by network uh, content inspection engine and also correlation engine, okay? So for your understanding. Then a uh, very important feature of this layer is actually ability to extract files. So remember I was talking about uh, hybrid nature of the device. So not only network layer will be inspected but also the application layer. So files will be extracted. And from there, uh, we send files to advanced threat scan engine. Advanced threat scan engine is a uh, um, very interesting uh, device. I would say maybe most interesting in this beside of the sandbox. Um, it contains number of techniques to detect threats in files uh, beside of these signatures, anti-malware signatures from Trend Micro, uh, which will detect known viruses, known malware. It also has heuristic mechanism uh, based on rules. Uh, it will be able to detect exploits, uh, the local exploits, right? So the network exploits we can detect on network content inspection engine, but the local exploits, um, uh, will be which exploit like uh, application, right? When it's already on the system. Um, we can detect it here as well. Um, it also has um, uh, hook to uh, machine learning. Um, and also things like um, uh, script analysis and so on. So because of this nature, especially heuristics, uh, we can see some subtle things, uh, for example, if we get RTF file uh, submitted in the email so we can extract it and we see RTF file structure is loose. So maybe there is space for exploit. So we can already indicate that. Uh, maybe there is um, uh, office file with um, um, VBA in the macro with which calls PowerShell, something like that, right? Uh, so that also can be seen as the heuristically uh, dangerous not necessarily malicious per se. So we can take uh, maybe further step and analyze it. So just to say you see detection names, uh, we'll highlight it here. Um, highlighter, you see detection names. So heuristics, H-E-U-R underscore, that will indicate detection from heuristic or XPL exploit detection, right? If you see some known name, that will be indication of known malware detection. Okay, and then from there again, uh, advanced threat scan engine will communicate to a correlation engine. And if needed, correlation engine will submit payloads to the sandbox analysis. 
And as Pierre said, it's a custom sandbox. We will detonate safely the sample in, in this environment and we'll see what happens based on, 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 on the rules, what happens with the system itself, right? Um, is the sample is going to encrypt files? Is the sample is going to change registry, make itself persistent? Maybe it's uh, going to wipe your disk. Maybe it's going to call back to command control center that we already know and so on and so on. Some bad activities which happens on the system, uh, we will detect. It's also interactive, so it also simulates the user interaction, right? If someone needs to click on URL, for example, it will happen. Now, when virtual analyzer, so that's the name for sandbox, detects something, you will see detection name VA underscore. Um, I like to see it right this. And in this case, uh, virtual analyzer will communicate back to content correlation engine saying, okay, I also have detection, okay? So the content correlation engine also will take advantage of the um, detection mechanism that we have in the cloud. So in the system, in the cloud smart protection network, we have a number of uh, services. We'll uh, quickly mention them. For example, <clears throat> we have um, um, cloud sandbox for uh, OS6 and Android, right? So that we can do, uh, let me see if it works. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, predictive machine learning as I, what I mentioned already. Um, uh, this also cloud service, basically we can uh, grab uh, payload, uh, quickly analyze it through the predict machine learning against all the data lake we have, and we can see whether this is something which is uh, similar to stuff that we've seen before, but has unique payload, right? So the signature does match. We have um, um, prevalence measurements, so file and domain sensors. If you get something in your network, which is let's say executable file, and this file we never seen before anywhere, right? From our point of view, from our perspective. This may have indication that it's either something your developers uh, put in the network and this is something new because they just compiled it or maybe indication of a uh, unique threat. So that's again, could be a reason for us to look closer in the sandbox for that. We have really rich data about reputation of stuff. So we have rep web reputation, uh, we have file reputation, domain reputation, and so on. So we can also call to that service and see if uh, the originating IP address or domain <clears throat> maybe has bad reputation. Maybe we are calling out from your endpoint to outside and this URL or domain also has bad reputation being part of the botnet, being part of, um, uh, command control group of particular APT group and so on and so on. Um, and yeah, some other scan engines, what I want to say about the last one uh, is RetroScan. It's also interesting um, uh, thing. So it helps you to detect um, breaches very quickly. So let's say there was advanced attack and despite of all our efforts, we missed it. And so the attack went through and there was a payload put in our network and it was communicating out, getting some other files and so on and so on. So they have open command control communication and we missed it altogether. But someone behind of this attack is, is not going to stop, right? So they are keep working and they keep creating new malware, they keep doing stuff. And we also develop our side. So we also develop new techniques and we also uh, increase the data in our uh, threat intelligence database. So maybe tomorrow this guy, uh, a lady, um, attacking someone else, making a mistake, maybe with the payload, maybe with the way how they attack. And by subtle signals, we can pick it, analyze it and see this is malicious activities. But we also can see now this infrastructure that they operate from um, is actually used uh, in the communication with our customers, which we've seen in the past. So that's the nature of RetroScan. We can analyze the data that we've seen yesterday against all the knowledge of today and make a statement that probably you were a victim of the attack yesterday or you know, two days ago. 
So that will significantly help you to shrink the exposure window. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just a word about retro scan and cloud sandbox. Uh, I mean, the Office scan, uh, sorry, the Mac OS and Android version. So because typically your European customers, they have, um, they, they ask, uh, okay, but this is cloud-based stuff. So we submit uh, data there and so on. So if I'm right, Dimitri, we um, retro scan is not able, but enabled by default. Um, no. And uh, cloud uh, yeah. and the cloud macOS Android sandbox um, can be disabled anytime. Anyway, we only yes. submit binaries for this. Um, yes, absolutely. So maybe very quickly, a retro scan can be found under detections. And if you go there by default, it's disabled. So you need to click enable retro scan to start using it. Yeah. Good, good. All right. Yeah. Um, okay, so the last box I didn't talk about is event classification engine, Logix. Uh, so uh, let me do it different way, consistency, I'll do it like this. So a network content correlation engine will use this um, engine to enrich the context. So for example, the Logix will be able to see DGCP radius and so on, DNS. And it will be able to create a context around the uh, maybe IP address uh, internally. So you can see um, uh, the MAC address, the operating system, the users maybe which uh, were authenticating and so on. So that helps later on in understanding of the detections when you work with it. Okay. And especially the stage of the attack also. And the stage of the attack as well, yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, one thing to mention is that um, the sandbox submission, the sandbox virtual analyzer, uh, oops, thanks. Um, the virtual analyzer is actually, um, um, the submission to that is manageable. Uh, so you can always uh, take advantage of the default settings. So in the virtual analyzer file submission, you have the default settings hmm. and um, I will probably kill all the yeah, graphs. So, you. Um, and you can see, for example, that in these default settings, we have heuristic detection and highly suspicious files uh, automatically submitted. And um, this resembles the, um, maybe for many uh, familiar firewall policy where you can have order. And then when the file is, um, detected by content correlation engine, it will be put through this order and it will take a decision, submit or do not submit, right? And you can change this uh, policy to your likings, but be careful if you uh, take, um, let's say, uh, too wide configuration and let's say submit everything or all doc files or PDF files, you have a risk of overloading your sandbox because if you throw everything at the sandbox, of course, it will start analyzing everything that you throw at it. So when you change this policy, be careful. Um, it's always good bet to go with default, but if you really need to change it, you can do that. Okay. And yeah, because of this very rich set of detection engines, we can also detect a variety of threat detection uh, of threats. Um, so uh, it could be, uh, known malware, uh, we can classify it as a ransomware, we can classify it as a backdoor, as a Trojan, as a spyware, as exploiter, as a downloader, and so on and so on and so on. So basically when you work with the, with the data uh, on DB Discover Inspector, you see there are lots of data. So if you take, let's say 30 days, lots of detections and you will see uh, Thread description here and detection name indicating different types of threads, right? So this is good because uh, then you have um, very rich uh, surface to work with, right? But on the other side, the downside of it is you need to understand how you work with this vast majority, what vast uh, data, how to make sense out of it. And that's what I will try to, to help you with in the next section. So basically, how would you do threat hunting with DB Discover Inspector? 
what uh, do we need to do? What do we need to consider? How do we make sense out of the uh, different detections and how do we connect dots? Um, so one thing I want to uh, mention is that when the attack order happens in the order that we've seen, so first you get intelligence gathering and then point of entry. From there, they usually have command control communication running um, and lateral movement happens later and data exfiltration. But when you work with the data as security analyst, um, in most of the cases, uh, it doesn't make sense to start with the point of entry because that will be probably the most, in terms of number, the most number of detections right, in, in sherry volume. So what you would start is actually in reverse order, right? From business point of view, I'm interested if there was maybe data exfiltration happened, right? If I lost some data, which is critical to my business. So you most probably will start with data exfiltration, although number of such events usually is very low. So that also gives you reasons to start with because you can just, you know, uh, take it from your view, uh, you check it, okay, no data exfiltration, that's good for today. Um, and then the next, and that's what you see here is also the statement. It's in general safe to start investigation from the command control detections. So command control usually means that, yeah, someone is calling out from inside, right? From my trusted network. So yeah, it's in most of the cases already indication of the infection. And you'd like to understand as soon as possible, how does it run and how to stop it, right? So command control, so data exfiltration, right? Um, so the um, it's last stage of attack. Um, we can detect data exfiltration through different protocols. Uh, so some of them you see here, and um, it's done by network content inspection engine. So it's um, driven by uh, rules and some important rules you see here. So um, you can always go to um monitoring scanning detection rules and here you can find this rule number so rule numbers here and see if they're enabled or they're disabled right so if enabled you will see this uh, check mark disabled this uh, um, yeah stop sign um, yeah gray means default settings if you see colors like green or red it means it was modified so find this uh, rule numbers and see if they are enabled, at least these numbers. And optionally, you can also enable packet capture for them, right? Because not all the rules, they are file-centric. So in file-centric rules, you can download a file from the detection, but some of them based on like DNS exfiltration or ICMP exfiltration, they will not have files. So you would need to have packet capture enabled in order to see what kind of data would work. So um, <clears throat> where you see data exfiltration in two places, affected hosts or all detections. Um, so in affected hosts, you see a lot of, uh, well, you might see a lot of, but I have just three for the last 24 hours. And um, if I look for seven days, a little bit more, as you can see in affected hosts, we have, um, lines correlated to specific hosts. And then in the, in the rows, uh, sorry, in the, in the columns, we have different stages of attack. Intelligence gathering, point of entry, command control communication, lateral movement, asset data discovery, data exfiltration and unknown attack phase. So here data exfiltration, you can take a look, for example, at the exfiltration of data, right? So that's one place. And you can click on it and you'll get to see for this specific host, I got two data exfiltration events, right? Um, you can also go inside. And as I said, for example, download detected file. So this secret.zip, analyze it and see what's inside, okay? So that's how I use it. And um, I also mentioned uh, all detections. No detections you can use because there are lots of data. You can use advanced search. You go to um, attack phase, 
where I shoot. Um, attack face, um, and then you can select data exfiltration here, right? Again, search. I need to do it seven days. What's also important is to make sure your detection severity is thrown to complete right, because data exfiltration might indicate um, normal behavior. So as such is not marked with, with uh, even medium severity. So you will have like informational, but if you don't have this slider completely right, you might miss it, okay? So what you do with it, uh, as I said, you do triage usually as security analyst. So maybe um, talk to your business users, see if it's normal business process. If it is maybe whitelisted, uh, you can download file. If it's not um, normal process, you can look inside, maybe again with the help of business and do risk assessments, right? Especially now in, a, in the era of GDPR, that's very important. So what you can also do from the incident response point of view, you can go to, um, uh, to the endpoints, to the server, see if the um, process which communicated to, to the destination of data exfiltration is still running, you can maybe stop it, analyze it. If you don't have it, maybe try to use EDR if you have to do retrospective analysis. And what kind of uh, process was trying to communicate to or communicate it to this destination, okay? So you can do investigation like this. So Dmitri, just before you, you you keep going on the CNC part, uh, we have a, yep. question, a question in in the live chat, uh, not related to data exfiltration for now, uh, but uh, related to um, uh, the source of uh, threat information. So, is there a way to integrate DDI with other uh, reputation source? So especially especially other web reputation source, uh, other threat intelligence database. So. What, what can we do here? It's a very good question, Pierre. Thank you, because it's winning to my next slide. <laughs> so as, um, of course, as, as, as we talked about it, there is a rich uh, threat intelligence data already accumulated by us in the Smart Protection Network. So we have great benefit of it. And what I'm also really, I think, uh, uh, proud of is that we use it in a contextual way. So it's not like, okay, here is the big terabytes of data and good luck with correlation. So we really apply this data contextually in the context of detection specific situation. So very efficiently, but if it's not enough and uh, some customers, they also have like community, uh, maybe industry wise, maybe geographical community and they get third party threat intelligence. Um, yeah, you can apply it. You can um, apply it in different forms directly in DDI. You can put it in forms of files. Uh, maybe YARLs, maybe <clears throat> uh, open IC and so yeah, on. Can, can you if show you it? Also, can you um, maybe show sure. some, some of the uh, option? Um, let me see. Um, so we can apply, of course, um, data to, um, to the whitelist and blacklist, right? So we can create uh, manually and we can also put, what was it? Um, Maybe integrated. By so we can have also YARLs for sandbox. So we can put it in here. So quite popular when you have uh, YARLs, especially after the analysis of some malware, you can put it in um, a part of the sandbox detection detect, you know, similar files as well. And um, uh, integrate products and services. Um, yeah, so we can put uh, Deep Discovery Director, uh, and we can integrate with the Deep Discovery Director with the sticks and taxi feeds, for example, and get the data insight. Um, so if you have any taxi feed subscribed to, you can stream it through the Discovery Director to the Discovery Inspector, by the way. Um, yeah. So. I think it's threat intelligence sharing, what you look for. Sharing. 
So here we can generate data and we can share with the third parties. Oh, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> for example, very um, uh, useful integration with your third party proxies because we have, um, um, <clears throat> we have uh, compiled the list of uh, malicious destinations based on our reputation as well and sandbox detection which you can basically use, uh, I can continue right now, you can use in uh, third party products like this. So whatever we have detected, uh, you can maybe enforce in your other security controls here. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, that would be... Yeah. So to be part of this ta taxi, for example, community, and using sticks, we will need to, to add the DDD, if I'm right, Dimitri. Yeah, Deep Discovery Director, which actually comes uh, as part of the deal if you buy Deep Discovery Inspector. And then Deep Discovery Director is full blown threat intelligence sharing center. So you can put inside uh, through sticks, taxi, you can do manual upload, you can use uh, API even, I think. You can put data in, uh, you can enrich it with. Um, detection locally so if your ddi runs and you have sandbox detection uh, which is your own threat intelligence you can put it in a mix in the discovery director um, and spn data is also so threat intelligence globally uh, being used as well so all of this mix third party global threat intelligence your local intelligence uh, you can uh, and your manual input you can mix it and you can share it at the exit at the output of the db sky director to maybe relate to uh, other members of your community again um, on a, on a taxi feed uh, in the sticks format for example uh, you can put it into third party products for maybe mitigation like firewalls proxies if you want for example block command control communication on time right as we've seen command control communication is the pivot for the attackers right if they lose this communication, they need to start all over again. So if you disrupt it, um, this will be a great value. So DB Scary Director is the threat intelligence platform that you can use to really improve your security operations for sure. All right, so CNC data sources, um, I think already quickly talked about it. Data comes from the Global th uh, Threat Intelligence Smart Protection Network. Um, in the context, right? So when the connection takes place from A to B, we can see A and B reputation, right? We're not putting all these terabytes of data needed to in the box. Virtual analyzer uh, of DDI, uh, also known as sandbox. So if we detect uh, malicious communication, which you attribute as command control, we also put it on the list. And then uh, network, um, uh, content inspection rules of DDI. So they, they also have ability to detect uh, command control communication based on technique. So we see from the previous attacks that um, uh, specific groups, they used uh, specific patterns. So they developed basically their own protocol to talk to command control servers. We can detect those in the content inspection level engine. Then of course you can manually add your defined addresses manually. So right, so you can say, okay, this I know for sure, uh, bad URLs, bad IP address, bad domain names. I want them to be detected as malicious. And as we just discussed, third-party threat intelligence feed. So through the discovery directory, you can connect third-party feed and whatever the others members of community have seen or experienced as you know as an attack. You can prevent by benefiting from the knowledge from them as well. Okay. Um, all right, and where you see command control communication, there are three places. And I must say actually uh, underneath you have just database of detections and the, um, the raw way to work with them is all detections. And then there is abstraction layer uh, around the uh, hosts, so you have uh, view on affected hosts, and there is no uh, one more abstraction layer, which is threats at a glance. Right? So very easy. We go to dashboard. We start uh, top down. You see threat at a glance. You have command control uh, detections here. 
and you see affected hosts, right? So you can click right here and you get to see uh, two hosts, like it was in a widget. And in a column CNC communication, you see detections. So that's again affected host, that's second place. The third place is again all detections, the same way as the data exfiltration you can see by looking at attack face and saying, I want to see only CNC communication. Okay. And then it will give you view on raw detections. So they are not particularly uh, correlated around one or another host. Right? Okay. So you see attack face here. So quite easy. Uh, another place uh, for command control callback addresses uh, is actually under detections menu, we have specific place called CNC callback addresses. Uh, so again, regardless of the source where we learned about the CNC, if it's detected, it will be placed on the list, right? So for example, I have here one address, uh, ca911winchipway.com. And I also see that it was used three times on the network, right? So I can see immediately how many times. And these are my three times, okay. Um, yeah, so that's also the place where you can check again for the last 24 hours, for the last seven days, for last hour, uh, depending on your um, style period of inspection, you can see whether there were CNCs or not. Very important, very important uh, communication for the attacker. Okay, uh, I will move on to lateral movement. So lateral movement um, uh, takes place after CNC is established. Uh, and you can think about, you know, pretty much anything what they can take advantage of. In terms of payloads, it could be exploits again, because internally we probably don't have all the systems patched. If they manage to sneak exploit inside through point of entry, they can shoot it uh, towards your vulnerable systems internally. And again, it's not only web or email, it can be anything, it could be SQL server, an application server, what you expose database with, uh, with vulnerability and so on. Um, then it could be malware, right? So if it's ransomware, which spreads like worm, you also can see that it's spreading through maybe vulnerability. Uh, maybe they use normal normal admin tools. We've seen that as well, right? So yes, exact, netcat. Uh, sometimes they install something, a tiny web service, easy to spread infection internally. Um, it could be also internal reconnaissance. That's what usually uh, I think happens is that when uh, they invade your network and then, okay, what's my environment I need to know. Before the attack, they need to scan it. So the network and ports can take place. And then it could be again, vulnerability attacks. Uh, it could be brute force like gains, right? Uh, maybe they already managed to re, uh, you know, um, discover names through social engineering attacks before and so on and so on. So uh, lateral movement um, also quite important to detect. And again, uh, cannot stress it enough. Uh, DB Scar Inspector can detect threats in more than hundred protocols. An actual lateral movement phase is the phase where you can kind of take advantage of it, because if someone shoots, uh, you know, uh, exploit towards a SQL database or application server or something else, um, you will be able to to see that because we can extract the payload. Lateral movement can be observed again on the same places: threats at glance, affected hosts, all detections. Um, so let's take a look quickly how it looks like. Um, again, on the threats at a glance, we see specific category lateral movement detections. Um, so we can click on it. We can also go through affected hosts um, and say, okay, what do we have? Lateral movement. What I want to say that while I'm saying lateral movement, we also do not need to forget that actually lateral movement also includes asset and data discovery. So when we look uh, for real lateral movement, we need to consider both phases. Right? 
Uh, and then the last but not least, again, all detections, you can find all the electro movement again in attack phases. So I'm repeating this so that you basically never forget it anymore. Uh, so electro movement, you can, and as a data discovery, very important. And then you search for it and you get to see a lot of them, right? So you see port scan, possible brute force login, and the malware propagation as well. Okay. Now. And then with that, we go to the last one, the point of entry. So point of entry will be, as I said in the beginning, in a big number. Um, especially if you position the device not their best practices. Best practices to put DBSCAR inspector data inspection feed under your last protective security control. Make sure that if it's kind of a known easy attack, it will be stopped. If it's advanced attack, that's what you want to see. If you do not obey to this and you put it you know, somewhere on a high level and you see a lot of dirty traffic, then point of entry will be overwhelming. So point of entry, it suggests um, it's basically communication from inside to outside, outside to inside, right? Crossing your perimeter. And um, it could be initiated by user, right? Uh, for example, someone gets email and then clicks on the URL and email, connection goes from inside to outside and gets additional payload. It's still point of entry, even that you connect outside um, because the payload comes inside and it's just, you know, weaponization uh, stage yet. Um, it's also possible that you have publicly available service and it's vulnerable, right? So then if they shoot from outside, they establish connection from outside to inside and they try to exploit vulnerability, that's also point of entry. So consider that. Um, and then in point of entry, we have um, two places to look at it. Um, Affected hosts all detections. And as I said, expect a lot of point of entries and make sure you connect the dots. You observe the whole chain, right? So for the sake of time, uh, let me quickly show you how the chain of the events would look like, right? I would start maybe as I suggested with our data exfiltration. So, I'm a security analyst would probably look at data exfiltration and would decide if I need to follow up on that. So looking for the last seven days, I have a couple of exfiltrations. And as I said, I look at that and it looks serious, so I need to investigate. So I even looked maybe in the file, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, so what's interesting that I need to see the source hosts and destination. I see that destination is the same and the sources are in the same network. So it's most probably campaign. So I need to take a look, right? So I have IP addresses, um, 137, 164 and so on. So I can look for them. I have actually prepared uh, already a list. So you can search for host IPs and you can start looking for example, okay, um, let's, yeah, let's make it longer. Um, so my first data exfiltration was here, uh, archive upload and from 137. So before that, I see this um, IP address was talking to command control server, CNC communication. And before that, that was a point of entry as well. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that, okay, I will analyze that later. What's interesting is then to see that from that moment on, this guy, 137, um, actually start, um, yeah, it keeps doing CNC and it starts electrical movement. So we see port scan 
from 137. So the port scan goes through different systems, including 164 and two and one, so gateways. And at some point, yeah, so probably this guy, 137, saw through the scan. Okay, I have Telnet. And now you see brute force, possible brute force, uh, Telnet response. So 164 responding to Telnet request of 137, right? You see again, it's lateral movement. And um, yeah, after some time, so 164 keeps communicating to CNC. After some time, we see uh, that actually uh, 164 um, started also doing the port scans, okay? It also got remote admin, hack tool, um, uploaded to itself, and then port scanning again, and you see that uh, it gets mimic ads. And at some point, we also see data exfiltration now from 164. So you see how they actually uh, literally move from 137 to 164. And then they keep communicating command control uh, center. Uh, and they're doing the data exfiltration as they go. They also can put inside the uh, hacking tools like mimic ads, they can install backdoors. So that's all the persistency they're building up <clears throat> to stay longer in your network. Because the longer they stay, the more data they can exfiltrate, the more business damage they can do, okay? Um, and they can they keep doing port scan and so on and so on. And then we see uh, data exfiltration takes place again and again, okay? So that's basically how would you go and connect the dots. Start with data exfiltration. If you don't have any, start with a command control communication. And then using the advanced filters, you can um, narrow your search and get lesser view and start connecting dots, understanding the stages of attacks, how this happens, how the um, adversary would work, and then you can also look in details and get more and more information. So Pierre, how are we looking time-wise? Do I have time for useful tips or do we do um, the next session? Yeah, maybe maybe I think you we, we spent a lot of good time on, uh, uh, on how to use um, the, exactly the DDI, what, what means each engine and some uh, some reading of, of the detection log. So I think it's great. Uh, we are already one hour. So I think for today, we're good enough. So we can set up a second session for more best practices. I know you prepared, Dimitri, uh, several tips to have more accurate detection, less false positive, more true positive, uh, better um, as yes. a severity rating. So I think it's, uh, yeah, let's make a second session. Okay. And can can I can I maybe uh, quickly talk about threat connect and threat intelligence? It's very important. Yeah, let's go okay. with threat connect, please. Okay. So we'll take, for example, um, this detection. So um, hacking tool, right? Um, when you have sandbox detection, that's uh, pretty straightforward. You can look inside of the report and you can understand what it is. But if you have detection um, based on um, maybe signatures or reputation, then it's difficult to understand what exactly the thing is doing and where is it coming from, right? So we have built inside of the product um, user interface towards our global threat intelligence uh, knowledge or data lake, you can say, right? So in each detection, you have this button called view and threat connect. So if you click on that, Hopefully it will take us to the right screen. So it's going outside, connecting to Threat Connect and giving us context about this particular detection. So what this hacking tool is and is it serious? Uh, should we be concerned about it? Um, yeah. So here we see that, um, well, the payloads at least, they are malicious. 
so the sources are less, uh, well, actually green. So it's, it's happening like this usually. You have reputable resource on the internet which could be hacked and then um, they have a payload serving the APT campaign maybe for some time, but the resource itself is not malicious. It's just particular payload which is coming from there. So we're interested in a hack tool, we can click on it and we get more information about this particular hack tool. Um, yeah, it takes time to, for me to connect. So the data is now being collected and um, you'll see correlation and information about um, what we know about this particular hack tool, how is it being seen on the internet, uh, different maybe URLs and resources where we've seen this being uh, sorted from. So that's uh, like this. And for example, remember CNC communication, CA911 windshipway.com. So that was actually used here. We've seen CNC. Yeah, this, right? So all this in C communications, CA9111. So that's, uh, we see also part of, you know, this. And we can take a look closer on, yeah, who is using this actually? What's part of the, um, maybe some, some group uses it as, you know, structurally. So this way you can, as security analyst, navigate from payloads to the resource where, which is using a CNC and that takes you to uh, malware families and it takes you actually uh, to a particular group. So this one says attacker group called LAAH and you can see what they're doing. So targeting government organizations in Taiwan, uh, it could be Germany, could be whatever. So um, this way you can go through the knowledge that we already have about this bad stuff and maybe prepare yourself for like next stage of the attack, what's coming, but you can also use it to maybe swipe your environment and look for these malicious payloads these attackers also using. Maybe they attacked you through other angle and they're using some other technique because if you're a target of this group, they'll be trying to get inside. So this is the power of Threat Connect. You can get a lot of knowledge uh, than just you see in, um, in a simple detection on DB Scout Inspector. So just wanted to highlight that. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah, this was a very good point. And I think our customer to get more knowledge about ongoing threats and really understanding the full pictures is, uh, could be very useful for them. So thank you, Dimitri. I will close um, in, a, in a just a few seconds this stream. So thanks a lot for your time, Dimitri. Thank you, Pierre. So everyone, thanks for watching today. So it has been a, a bit longer than uh, expected, but a uh, lot of, of uh, information to share on DDI. So we will um, we will do certainly a second session for uh, the additional tips and best practice on the configuration itself. Um, I will, so please uh, subscribe to the channel and you will get then um, informed about the next session. Um, and also I will uh, share part of the description of this video uh, um, that will be published, of course, uh, later on uh, on our uh, Trend Micro channel. So you will have the slides um, that used uh, Dimitri, so for your reference and anytime feel free to reach out to your um, Trend Micro um, account manager or sales engineer reference and uh, we're there to help and to answer any question. So thanks for your time today and hope you enjoy the session and uh, take care of you. Bye-bye.